Before introducing uh, Beatrice Economino, I, I just want to hand over the word to uh, Louise Marillier, who's the chairman of Stockholm Architect for Rianning. Um, uh, and as you know, this uh, event has really been run in partnership. They're one of the people who very generously made this event possible. Um, so Louise, can I hand Thank over you. to you? They're nearly all sitting down. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to make a short introduction. Uh, welcome to the first lecture uh, of this fall. Uh, this week, uh, we're having a heavy week with three lectures. Uh, today, um, Beatrice Colomina and Tim will shortly introduce her properly. Uh, tomorrow, uh, a debate and hearing about Slussan, uh, Politik eller Stadsbyggnad, Politics or City Planning. Uh, you're very welcome to that. And we hope that you will all join us in the Architecture Museum's uh, exhibition hall. Um, on Thursday, and there has been a time change, uh, Louisa Hutton from Sarbrush Hutton uh, at 15.30, which is um, half past three. Please join us, although that's a little bit earlier uh, than we thought from the start. Very interesting architect. Um, and we think, we think that would be of great interest to a lot of practitioners. Um, I think I will end there. Uh, that's this week's program. On Thursday, I will talk a little bit more about what will happen during um, the end of September and October. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's... Let's resume. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome here uh, Beatrice Colomina. Um, I'm not going to say too much at this stage, uh, but I can, I can kind of give you a very rapid summary. I think one of the, in terms of what I said at the very beginning, um, it, it feels very nice to have assembled people who can give takes on this question from various angles. Um, Beatrice is uh, professor of, she's an architectural historian um, and professor of um, architecture at Princeton University where she's the founding director of the program in uh, the person with the wrong glasses I can't even read things um, sorry about this uh, she's the founding director of the program in uh, uh, Mead Mass Media, the uh, uh, sort of program Media and Modernity at Princeton University. Um, as you all know, she's published widely uh, books including Privacy and Publicity, Modern Architectures, Mass Media, uh, Sexuality and Space, and uh, more recently, uh, Domesticity at War. And um, throughout that work, the question of... Uh, architecture mediaization and how architecture and media have worked together and um, alternative narratives around architecture and its history have been central. So welcome and thank you very much for coming. Beatrice. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be, to be here. I feel like I'm having a flash from, uh, from the back with all these uh, people that I know from a long time back. Uh, believe it or not, I was uh, invited here to Estocolm when I was really very young. And, and uh, I think Privacy and Publicity was not even published uh, yet. And uh, several people that are here, like Katharina Gabrielson, uh, Aman, and Anna Betancourt, had, and another stu young student, had invited me to lecture here. And then Privacy and Publicity appeared in, in Swedish, so I feel like, uh, which was one of the first translations together with the Japanese. So I always feel like I have a, 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 an affiliation some sort of uh, connection with uh, with this place and you know these places around the world that somehow uh, for some reason uh, resonate. So thank you very much. It's always uh, great to to be here. Um, I'm going to take a different uh, uh, angle because of course I even if I'm from Spain I teach in the United States where the teaching of history and theory is uh, uh, different. Uh, done in uh, in the AEA and in other uh, uh, European uh, schools, 
And I was struck in, in many ways by the formulation of this uh, event and by some of the things that uh, Mark was saying, uh, such funny stories about uh, the teaching of, uh, of, of history and the student architect, uh, because it reminds me of the debates that happened in the United States around 1967, as, uh, as I will show uh, very quickly. But before that, I want to show you um, a sentence that struck me around 2003 when uh, Bernard Tumi, who had been dean of the School of Architecture for 15 years, was living. And uh, a recently uh, founded uh, kind of tabloid, the Architects newspaper, this is the number one, evaluated uh, his performance as a dean very positively. And he says exactly this, what I put in the screen so you could not miss what I am saying, because sometimes with the accents these things happen, right? Its faculty and alumni are constant fixtures in exhibitions, publications, and buildings shortlist all over the world. So you have noticed immediately that not only exhibitions and publications are ahead of buildings uh, in, this, uh, in this list, but the buildings are not actually real buildings either. The buildings are buildings, uh, shortly, uh, for uh, competitions or whatever. That is, whatever, whether the, the building in the end gets built or, or not is not at all a measure of success in this account. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, whether architects win the competition or don't win the competition also seems to be uh, beyond the point. The project has been made, the project is, uh, is photographed, is published, is, is criticized. The project already exists in a way. Uh, the project exists as an architectural idea, a form of thought, and this is uh, actually very relevant uh, in architecture. The same criteria uh, applies to evaluating uh, architectural su success in, in, uh, in, uh, in most uh, schools of architecture in North America for the tenure process. You know what the tenure is? It's like a, uh, when you become a full professor, right? And it's a very, very difficult process in which you get compared with people all over the world, etc. Well, the criteria precisely to become a full professor uh, as an architect has nothing to do with uh, with uh, with building. I mean, probably if you are you have a lot of buildings. You you probably will not get tenure just with that. The criteria tends to be more like what have you written, right? So the book, the exhibition, uh, the competition entry, all kinds of forms of uh, of speculation are uh, precisely the measures of inter international uh, recognition and success. That is. Uh, 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 that is uh, that is basis for for tenure in American uh, schools. I think that things are very different uh, in Europe, but also uh, is the teaching of history. Paradoxically, the situation in the United States, I think, brings historians and theories uh, teaching today in these uh, schools uh, very close, precisely to so-called practicing architects, because what these uh, uh, architects are practicing is precisely the art of making uh, a book, putting together an exhibition, and entering a competition, that is intellectual activities, which involve research, writing, and thinking. And meanwhile, historians and, and theorists of, uh, of architecture teaching in the schools, for the most, most part in, in, in the last uh, at least uh, 30 to 40 years, are trained as architects. This started with the generation of, let's say, the Kenneth Franton, Tony Bidler, Alan Cojun, people that went to architecture school and found themselves uh, teaching history and theory. They didn't do really a PhD, but they were the recognized uh, uh, historians of architecture uh, in schools of architecture in North America, mostly imported from from England and from uh, other other places uh, in Europe, sometimes too. So you have this this uh, completely different situation now with the establishment of the PhD programs in architecture, which in the United States didn't, didn't happen until the 70s, and again happened all more or less at the same uh, time. I had a, actually a list. Uh, 64 was Penn, 68 Cornell, 70 Berkeley, 73 Princeton, 74 MIT, 87 Harvard. It took a long time to Harvard to think that this was a worth uh, thing to do. Uh, even longer to Columbia University, 94, and only last year, Yale University decided that a, that a PhD program in architecture uh, was an important thing. 
So from that uh, very first generation of uh, uh, people with uh, PhDs, you can count people like Michael Hayes or Mark Wigley or Mark Jarsonbeck or myself uh, and, and Mary McLeod and a number of other historians also teaching in, in the schools. And then there are OR students, the next generation, which will be uh, the Detlef Martins, uh, Reinhold Martins, Sarah White, and that who are very, very, very first uh, students. What is interesting about this uh, each generation is that many of them uh, not only were trained as an architect, but have not abandoned the practice of architecture either. So you have people like, I don't know, uh, Reinhold Martin or, or, or Sarah Whiting or Peggy Reamer, who did a PhD, uh, or, or Jennifer Bloomer, but also continue some form of practice uh, uh, at the same time. In any case, we are all somehow, somehow involved in the teaching of design. Maybe because the schools are so small, there is not the possibility of being in a school like Princeton, for example, and being just a teacher of history and theory. You have to be either teaching a studio or involved in some way as a studio critic, etc. So in many ways, all of us uh, participate. Also, um, as a result, I think, of the kind of nature of the interdisciplinary programs in um, uh, PhD programs that were established in the United States, there were a lot of people that came into the schools of architecture that did not have uh, an architecture background, not even an art histor historian uh, background. People like uh, Jeffrey Kibnes, or that, I, I don't know, physics was his, his background, right? <laughs> or people like, I don't know, uh, Sandy Quinter, uh, who had studied comparative literature. There were a lot of them who didn't, uh, Sylvia Levin, Catherine Ingraham, Bob Somol, Jeffrey Kibnes, Sam Fikwinder, all of those, uh, Mark Hansen, all these uh, uh, people that came into uh, the school of, of architecture without architectural background, they became also involved in some way in studio teaching in the form of reviews. Uh, uh, Sylvia Levin has uh, taught the studios, Quinter and Kipnis have taught the studios, so they all have become involved. So there's this confusion between what is design and what is theory and criticism that maybe is very productive. Uh, even uh, uh, some of them, not having any architectural background, have even been involved in architectural practice. For example, Somor, who had a PhD in, um, I don't know what, in the history of culture from the University of Chicago, built a house with, uh, with his partner and, and then became dean of a school of architecture in Chicago. So you can even be dean of a school of architecture and not have an architecture uh, uh, degree. Now, what are, I, and in some ways that's kind of co contrast with the fact that the architects themselves that are teaching in the school for the most part, as demonstrated by this, act, not actually building, but build, doing books, exhibitions, and entering competitions, right? So that, in a way, is uh, bringing an interesting uh, situation in which uh, there is almost, almost a reversal uh, in the uh, uh, teaching of history in the schools. It is in that sense that I think it may be worthwhile to go back to this debate of 1967. It was organized by the Society of Architectural uh, Historians, and the event was called Architectural History and the Student Architect. And then Sibyl Moholinas, who was uh, uh, opening the event, expressed her dismay over the status of uh, history in schools of architecture, very much reminiscent of what, uh, of what Mark was just uh, saying now, uh, saying precisely what you see in the screen. Why to teach a discipline which is generally rejected by practitioners? Uh, second, whom to select for such an unpopular task? and how to implement the ordeal of four credit units of glazed eyes, chronic absenteeism, and interfaculty condensation. <laughs> it's exactly like the situation that, uh, that Mark has described uh, so uh, nicely uh, for us. She rejected very strongly, and so did many people in this conference, the idea that art historians could teach uh, uh, history to architects. And then she says something also beautiful. Repeated experience has shown us that the art historical day, and, and by day means in another sentence she had say, the art historical product of our fine art institutions are like juvenile alcoholics. In that no matter how sincere their intentions may be of drying themselves out, they will return to the, the euphoria of a Woodhart, Wolfram, Panosky, and Green at the first sniff 
of a familiar historical uh, interior. I think, I mean, somebody should do some study of these civil Mohoninas, because, I mean, with, for all we know about Mohoninas, we don't know anything about her, not that much, and she is really an incredible person. But anyway, so she concludes uh, 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 this uh, uh, speech by saying that only an architect of unusual perception and education or an architectural critic uh, will be up to the task of teaching history uh, to architectural uh, students. Of course, uh, well, of course, <laughs> if we apply what Mark has said, I cannot say of course anymore, but we cannot uh, claim to be in, the, uh, in this situation uh, today, at least, as I say, in the United States. On the one hand, historians uh, in the School of Architecture uh, are largely uh, today architects uh, <coughs> trained in PhD programs, programs that were established precisely, uh, uh, precisely uh, uh, up from the point uh, of departure of these arguments uh, made in that uh, in that uh, conference. On the other hand, far from empty uh, uh, classrooms and glazed eyes, theory and history seminars are oversubscribed in all the elite schools, and the number and quality of the offerings of the seminars offer are often the bone of contention uh, between students and administrators, with the students being the ones demanding more and better uh, seminars. This happens every semester. We have a lot of uh, seminars in history and theory in, in Princeton and other colleges. Every fall, the same thing. There are not enough seminars. What do you mean there are not enough seminars? You can have a seminar if there are five students in, you can hold that seminar. So imagine how many seminars there are, right? They still, you know, it's, uh, we have still have to invite a lot of people. So in addition to the faculty of uh, Princeton, let's, let's say just this semester uh, or this year, we are inviting Jean-Louis Cohen, Sylvia Levin, Jorge Otero Pilos. That is, it's not ever felt that a school has enough history and theory, even with a lot of people uh, in, the, um, in the faculty. So in a way, the, the situation is completely different. It's a huge demand, and we may wonder why it, that is, right? But I think, in any case, we need to reassess the teaching of history in light of the contemporary situation. It is now over 30 years that uh, these debates happen and that, as a result of them, uh, PhD programs in history and theory uh, and criticism, by the way, so they are never history of PhDs in history, but PhD in theory history and criticism began to emerge in universities such as uh, MIT, Cornell, Princeton, Berkeley, and Penn. They were preceded, as I say, by long and elaborate debates on the need for such programs, both inside the schools and also at the universities. Art historians and art historical methods were found uh, wanting, and the architect-trained historian was seen as a much more desirable figure to educate architectural students. So PhD uh, students were understood at the beginning as a service to the School of Architecture. The service to the service, we may say, since architecture has always been seen as a service or understood as a service uh, profession. But of course, much has changed uh, on the side of history and also on the side of the practice. We have ended up with a whole new generation of architectural scholars that were trained first as architects, but also with a whole new generation of practitioners who think of themselves as researchers because precisely practice has changed uh, too. So much of what goes on in a practice uh, today, uh, in a professional practice today, is a form of research. A few years ago, this uh, only people like Dylan and Escofidio or OMA will say that the research uh, was uh, in any way part of their practice, but now any practic any practically any architect with a head will tell you uh, that research is a very important uh, a part of uh, of, uh, of, their, of their work. It is hard to find uh, an architect that doesn't use research as a kind of magic word to describe and legitimize uh, their practice. These architects may build or not build, but they are definitely doing some kind of research that is registered in publication, exhibitions, competitions, etc. Competitions are no uh, uh, only ways uh, to get a commission, but ways to present innovative, innovative uh, uh, research. Publications and exhibitions are not produced to register already built work, 
but to present uh, new ways of thinking about architecture. And what interests me as a historian is that this is actually not such a new uh, situation. That is, that you can say that the entire history of 20th century architecture could be uh, written uh, from uh, uh, that point of view. If I find my notes here, we could go to this question. That is, that the history of avant-garde uh, architecture uh, is uh, in, in, in art and in literature is actually inseparable from the history of his engagement uh, with uh, uh, different kinds of media. And it is not, again, it's not that the avant-garde used magazines or other forms of media to publicize their work. The work did not exist before its publication, and this is a very important distinction. For example, everybody knows that futurism did not really exist before the publication of the Manifesto of Futurism in uh, the newspaper uh, Le Figaro. Or Le Corbusier didn't even exist before the publication of his uh, uh, magazine L'Esprit Nouveau, a magazine that he publishes between 1920 and 1925. And even if you don't know this magazine, you definitely know the books that came out of this. These books are made up entirely of uh, uh, the chapters are really articles that he had published in, in the magazine before. In that sense, also a very modern form of, of making a book. Even the very name Le Corbusier didn't exist uh, before uh, L'Esprit Nouveau. It was a pseudonym uh, that uh, Le Corbusier invented to um, write about architecture in uh, L'Esprit Nouveau. So you can say that Le Corbusier is an effect uh, of a little uh, magazine. Even architects uh, like Miss van der Rohe, who are primarily thought in terms of, I don't know, craft, tectonics, etc., did not really exist also uh, without, uh, without media, right? Without magazines such as G, which is the magazine uh, that he published, and many other little magazines that he was part of, like Frulit or Mirth. Here is Mirth. And again, it's not just that the work of those architects uh, is published in these magazines. The work was produced precisely for these magazines. So you can think about these magazines as really a construction uh, site. Let me take uh, Miss very briefly as a case study uh, here. Anybody who has the most kind of cursory knowledge of Mies knows that Mies plays in architectural history. His role as one of the kind of founders of the modern movement was established by a number of, uh, of projects, like uh, five projects in, 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 in particular, that you can see here, which is the Friedrich Strasse skyscraper of 1921, the Glass skyscraper of 1922, the reinforced concrete building of 1923, and the concrete and brick country houses of 1923 and 1924. So it was precisely these uh, five projects, this kind of five, if you want, paper architecture, together with the publicity apparatus enveloping them, that made me into a historical figure. The houses that he uh, had been able to build so far, you can check, you know, just by yourself, and that he will continue to develop during the same years will have taken him uh, nowhere. Well, of course, you could argue, if you have a little bit more of a knowledge of me, that the real house of 907 was actually noted by a critic and published in, a, in one important magazine, the modern Bauformer. But between, this is really amazing, nobody really sees that, but between the publication, the modest publication of this house in 1907 and Mies' own publication in Frulicht of his own glass skyscraper, that is between 1907 and 1922, nothing of Mies was published. Nothing. Zero. Right? Can you imagine trauma for somebody who definitely was a very ambitious person? Right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have done what he did for all of us, right? And I, I mean ambitious in a, in a, in a positive uh, uh, sense, right? So it is, I think, this, these moments which, uh, I mean, I think uh, you, can, you can think about the whole history of architecture from, from that point of view. Not only that, but Mies can be seen perhaps as, as with no other architects of the modern uh, movement, a kind of true case of schizophrenia between his published work in Frulik, for example, and the projects that he was developing for his uh, real clients. That is still in the 90, in the 20s, at the same time that he was developing his most <coughs> radical pro projects, he was able to build such houses as the Villa Eichstatt in Berlin, 
1921-23, that is in the same year that he's doing the glass skyscraper, or the Villa Mosler in Potsdam. Now, we could all go around and say we can blame it on the client, for example, and say the client, well, okay, Mosler, sure, was apparently a conservative banker and the house is supposed to have reflected uh, his taste. But then I found out doing a little bit more of research, something astonishing. In 1924, an art historian and a contract constructivist artist, Walter Dexter, who was very much interested in modern architecture and supportive of modern architecture, commissioned me to do a house for him. And Miss basically blew, blew it. He couldn't come up with the modern house that his client desired. He kept giving one excuse after another. The deadline was uh, continuously postponed until the client just gave up on him. So in many ways, uh, what Miss was able to achieve in the printed page, he was not able to achieve yet in a, build, in a building, right? So it will take him a long time. He was, an, in a way, trying to catch up with his publications, that glimpse of, of him that he saw in the publication is that what he tries so hard to achieve. That's probably why he kind of uh, strives to produce this kind of sense of realism in the representation of his projects, as in the, for example, in the photomontage of the glass skyscraper with cars flying by on the Friedrichstrasse, as if he were to convince us that the project already exists, or perhaps more important, as if he were to convince himself that the project is real, that it's already there, right? So almost like a mirror uh, stage uh, uh, image of, of Lacan, no? the media acts for the architect as a mirror stage. I, I know I cannot do it yet, but, but I have the image of where I am going, right? right? So this beautiful uh, uh, moment. Of course, it's not just me or, uh, uh, or Le Corbusier, but many, many architects of the, of the 20th century, and even groups like the Steel or Archigram didn't even exist before the publication. I mean, Rainer Bauhan tells this very beautiful story of how he was walking the dog one day. He used to live across the street from Peter Cook, and there's this limousine with Japanese uh, architects that all come out in the street and ask him, uh, where is the office of Archigram? And Barnhans remembers to be completely perplexed because Archigram didn't have an office, didn't exist as an architectural office. Archigram was that leaflet that, <laughs> that was being printed basically in the kitchen of Peter Cook, right? And, and, and it was later in retrospective that these heterogeneous groups of architects they decided to capitalize on, on what they have achieved with this little piece of paper, with this Archigram, which was basically nothing, right? All over the world, they knew Archigram and they called themselves as a team Archigram, right? So the, the publication, again, had produced Archigram, right? Without denying the importance of all the work they would have done. Of course, in the case of Archigram, it's almost funny because they didn't build anything until very recently. I mean, the first project of Peter Cook is in grass a few years ago, and I don't know what we think about that. But the interesting thing is that the history of architecture is full, is precisely full of such figures that never actually build that much, right? But that they change the discourse, they change the way in which we think about architecture. All right, so where I am. Um, so, um, so this is a, is a key part of the evolution of architecture. The architecture of the last century, or the 20th century, and I think is, is, is the case today too, is really produced in the space of photographs of publications and exhibitions, world fairs, magazines, uh, museums, art galleries, international competi competitions, films, television programs, computers, and the net right now. Eh? I suppose that, that they, there are some very, very interesting uh, things that we are not even able to talk about yet, but they are produced in the space uh, of the media. And this obvious fact, which is almost embarrassing in its uh, simplicity, has been difficult to accept, particularly by academias, by academics. That is, it's counterintuitive, I suppose, to see the history of architecture as the history of ideas rather than the history of buildings, to see that those parts of architectural practice that seem more ephemeral and temporal, like a pavilion in a fair, turn out to have more, the most permanent effect. To see that a sketch like that one of the of the brick house of of Mies, uh, can have more power than a building uh, resulting from it. That three sentences in a magazine can change the course 
of the sign, that of a video in, uh, in a fair that nobody saw. 1929 was not exactly a year to go around uh, doing tourism, so nobody really saw the Barcelona pavilion, but nevertheless, it's declared to be, in all the books of architecture, the most beautiful monument of the 20th century, right? Until recently, it didn't exist. The monument, monument were the publications, the drawings, the photographs that have survived and that were published uh, in this moment, right? So the temporary then uh, turns out to be uh, permanent. Ideas live on, or as Andrea, and it's also interesting that Mies, in a way, starts to catch up with himself, that he starts to be able to put in build form the ideas that he was uh, so able to do in graphic uh, uh, form, precisely in the context of uh, exhibitions and temporal pavilions like the Barcelona uh, pavilion. Here is Miss uh, saluting the, the king of Spain inside the Barcelona pavilion. Anyway, so the temporary was there for only a few weeks, a very few people saw it precisely for the conditions that we just talked about. Also, no, it was not like in 1929 people traveled that much. And, uh, but precisely for the economic circumstances, apparently not even people from Madrid went to Barcelona to see it, right? But anyway, it's inscribed in the mind of everybody in the architecture way. We know it, right? So um, ideas uh, live on, or as Andrea Bransi has put it recently, architecture is not simply something physical, but a much more complex culture whose projects are forms of thought that interpret the world. I think that the architect of the future should begin with the idea that the energies that transform the city and the territory are not only uh, building activities, but also the power of imagination and pure research, what has been thought exists. And I think this is uh, very important to understand in architecture. Thoughts are reality. And, and, and then I get the question, what does this mean uh, for the teaching of history in schools of architecture? I think an, a historian uh, and a theorist should remind uh, the so-called media architect, by which I mean the architect of at least starting with the 20th century, uh, remind the media architecture that the history of architecture is more complex than the history of buildings and building techniques. And that as Sibyl Moholin has already say in 1967 in that very uh, uh, event that I was mentioning before, uh, in the age of the media, the historical survivors, that's her work, historical survivors, are architects who can write that is, who can reproduce themselves in different kinds of media. Reproduction that is understood not as the representation of existing work, as I was saying before, but which media treated as a site for the production of a new work, of a new uh, idea. The greatest architects of the 20th century were all, in a way, media artists who work is embedded between the media uh, campaign they carefully orchestrated. Uh, and that's why we know them. A question that I like to ask uh, uh, many times to uh, entering uh, master students uh, at Princeton and even undergraduate students is tell me how many architects of the 20th century you know who didn't write, right? And of course, there may be exception, but the reality is that you start at the beginning of the century and you go with Franjo Wright and Adolf Loos and Le Corbusier and Gropius and, and they're all big writers. And even me, who passes by one that it was so silent and everything has a whole book with all the things he wrote, so he wrote a lot. And then you get to the mid-century and the architects that kind of made it uh, uh, in, in some way, uh, it's again Alison and Peter Smithson who didn't build that much but wrote a lot, and then uh, Venturi and Scott Brown, I mean, so all this, uh, uh, Aldo Rossi with the architecture of the city, so it's precisely uh, Peter Eisman who until recently didn't, uh, so I keep moving into the century, right? And, and it continues to be the, the same. Architects who uh, publish uh, books who almost didn't uh, manage to, uh, to build anything, are more important in architectural <coughs> histories than architects that, uh, that build a lot and were unable to formulate what that was about, right? I mean, they didn't have a theory about their work. If you continue throughout the century, it is full of examples. I mean, think about Rem Kulhas. Between Delirious New York, it's like almost like the case of Miss. Between Delirious New York and his first actual build work, lots of years pass, but nobody notices, right? He was already famous for Delirious New York, precisely, right? And there were all these little projects here, and then uh, and finally he managed to build something in Rotterdam, I don't know, or the Hague, which one was the first one? But it took a long, long, long time for him to get to that point. Same with Peter Eisman and all these uh, House 1 and House 2, most of them were on, on um, 
on paper, right? And, and likewise, the uh, new generation, or, or not so new anymore, of, uh, let's say, Greg Lim. How many buildings have Greg Lim built, right? But, but books and, and, and articles, and so we know him, right? We do. But, I mean, do you know any of his work? Probably, maybe you have seen the Korean charts, and is there anything else? I don't remember, but it's one of the names that you it has a it has a name rec recognition, right? All the figures of the uh, same with uh, uh, FOA, except that FOA at least won the competition of Yokohama and built it, so therefore there is more work there. Jesse Reiser until recently uh, uh, um, didn't uh, build anything at all, right? Uh, Asin Todd, uh, Hani Rashid, and uh, Lisan Couture again, until recently, and in Abu Dhabi or Dubai. I mean, it's also very interesting how this last generation had been given the opportunities to build in the places more far away from where they are, right? So it's not Europe and the United States who has given, the countries which have given uh, opportunities to build to a new generation of uh, avant-garde uh, architects, but it has been precisely in China, in Dubai, and in Abu Dhabi, and it's only uh, very recently. Um, so, so if this is the case that architects uh, need uh, to write that uh, that this is a, a very important uh, uh, a part of what an architect is, and not only in the 20th century. The 20th century is just an exercise because everybody knows some architect from the 20th century. But if you go back to, to all the other centuries, you starting with Alberti, you end up with the same the same conclusion. So the point is that students have a double interest. In, uh, 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 in history and theory classes, learning about the history of their field and also learning how to operate in the present becomes the same uh, thing. So history, in, our, in, our, in other words, is uh, indistinguishable uh, from the sign. For the PhD students, uh, this blurring of historical research and practice is even more emphatic since uh, for them, research is by definition a form of practice. That is, if MRs have to learn that design involves some sort of historical uh, and theoretical production, the PhD students, I think, have to learn that history is a form of architectural uh, uh, production itself. And in that sense, I think that we have to rethink the way we think uh, we teach PhD students. Just as doc doctoral research uh, is uh, informing design in new ways, I think that design could inform research and pedagogy. That is the model of the isolated scholar uh, doing their PhD in some kind of obscure uh, theme, I think is no longer uh, appropriate or adequate for our times. The collaborative uh, applied thinking of design studios can be a model uh, for, the, for scholarly uh, research. This may be a delay uh, lesson for something that we already learned in the 70s with the studios like Lenin from uh, Las Vegas, which presented uh, uh, this method of collaborative research uh, in a studio context that is one of the most influential books and theoretical positions of our times emerged precisely in an academic context, in an academic co in a context of a studio and a number of seminars, because what Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi did is to turn that whole uh, semester, they took all the credit so that they would teach the studio and also uh, the seminars or their associates. So they were all working collaboratively in the same uh, project. As I say, uh, I think we need to reassess uh, the teaching of PhD program. Uh, and perhaps that passes also by starting to understand that PhD students are not simply abandoning architecture to become kind of boring uh, history and theory uh, professors. On the contrary, I think they have made a quite uh, romantic uh, decision to explore the hidden corners of our field, uh, to change the limits of our field. I think scholars, in a way, in that sense, are artists, and this establishes a kind of deeper bond between designers and academics, even if the projects and curriculum are uh, so different. PhD students carry out research uh, exploring areas that the field has never explored uh, before. That means that PhD research is, is highly creative uh, by definition because the scholars operate in, in, in kind of unexplored uh, territory. They have to invent trails, design the trails, and develop ways of interpreting them uh, or what they find along these trails. In that sense, uh, they are designing uh, the future stage of the discipline. 
And it is in that sense that I think that PhD is kind of an art form and that PhD uh, students are operating or could operate as a kind of, uh, des as designers. It is in this sense that in the last uh, uh, about 10 years, nine to 10 years, I have been trying to car carry out a number of uh, pedagogical experiments in which you have PhD students working collaboratively on a single theme, and the results of the research, and this is very important uh, to me, are made public in a book, a conference, an exhibition, a film that is also prepared by the students. So the students learn both how to do research and how to put together a project, an event, or a publication. Right. The first one was this one, uh, Cold War uh, Hot Houses, which is a study of uh, post-war America, and it went for two years of research, and, and it ended up in the publication of this book. Very quickly, then, we did a study which resonates with the one of today, which is about the history of the PhD uh, programs in architecture in the United States, and we invited all the founders of these programs and many other people including Mark Hassan is here, and Michael Hayes, and Sandy Quinter, and so many, Mark Jarsonbeck, and Peter Eisman, and Denise Scott Brown, Sarah White, and Mark Jarsonbeck. It was everybody who has been involved in PhD uh, programs. And the third one is, um, perhaps you have no, known it, is Clip Stanford, which is the exhibition of uh, little magazines that uh, started in a storefront for art and architecture and then moved to several uh, locations around the world, including uh, here in, uh, in Scandinavia and Oslo, right? Uh, in the 60s, there was this huge explosion of little magazines that uh, Banham is uh, somehow echoing uh, here, one soon rave and it's not ready to stay go, even if it seems look. It is sometimes looks like the sound effects are produced by the erupting of underground architectural protest magazines. Architecture state queen mother of the art is no longer courted by plus glosses and cool scientific journals alone, but is having her skirts blown up and her bodies and sip by regular newcomers, which are typically rhetorical with it moralistic, misspelled, <laughs> improvisatory, anti-smooth, funny format, clicky, art-oriented, but stone out of their minds with science fiction images of an alternative architecture that will be perfectly possible tomorrow if only the universe was differently organized. <laughs> and I think it's very nice to go back to this kind of a statement because, I mean, I wish that we could, in a way, and this is also part of what I think is important in PhD programs, recover the kind of the freshness of a critic like uh, Banhan to react to something that is happening in front of his... Uh, of his eyes, right, and re react with this freshness and with this kind of language instead of the pedantic uh, kind of language that have uh, kind of started to populate all the uh, PhD programs. Anyway, so the clip stand for, uh, 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 as you can see here in, uh, in New York, in the storefront, uh, it is, uh, uh, as I say, this uh, great uh, explosion uh, of magazines that we somehow managed to put together in this exhibition, which is, the, you can see the elements there, the, the timeline, the wallpaper, in the bubbles are the originals. In these little kind of things are like all the interviews that we carry all over the world, more than 100 interviews from Japan to anywhere uh, in, uh, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada with protagonists. Uh, uh, we also, uh, these are the originals, of course, inside the bubbles. We also did facsimiles so people can, could have their hands on the, on the magazines. And very important, uh, the fabrication itself of the uh, 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 the design of the exhibition, of course, but even the putting together of the exhibition was part of, of our work. So you have, have here PhD students mounting the exhibition at the storefront, and I think it's very, it was kind of very refreshing to see PhD students, because you, know, you always see them pale in the library with some books and so on, so with these electric drills, or putting up uh, wallpaper. I walk in the gallery one night, and it's four o'clock in the morning, and they were all like dirty here with all the wallpaper. I think in the end, it's a very good therapy for um, you know, how do you call that, writer's blocks and all, all disorder, disorders or <laughs> diseases of the scholar that are very real, no? But somehow, and it's also, uh, because as I say, most of them have an architectural uh, background, it's also a way uh, of not forgetting where you are coming from. In a way, it was something very beautiful that Denise Scott Brown say to Bob Venturi, 
uh, about this, uh, this project. She says something to him that I always remember. She says something, but Beatrice knows that the first love of those students is arch architecture, and she wants to remind them of their first love. And in a way, I think it's, it's right that uh, it's a huge amount of research that was done for this project with, uh, as I say, more than 100 uh, magazines that were study, interview, people interview, oral history. It goes, uh, it, it's never ending because as we go from different places, more magazines are added, more research, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's seri very serious uh, scholarly research, but also uh, the making itself of the exhibition as you know, of course, uh, exhibitions are a form of architecture. So the fact that you have become uh, a scholar doesn't mean that you have to give up all of this. Also creating events, bringing all the protagonists and this, uh, to discuss, for example, here the beginnings of opposition with Kenneth Frampton, Peter Eisman, Mario Anderson, and Anthony Widler, or the beginnings of... Uh, uh, and it was so crowded, you see, even we have to be practically on top of the speakers in the gallery, in the storefront, those are the students in, in the back, um, standing room only. Another night we discussed October, Rosalind Krauss, Eva Lambois, Hal Forster, another night the English were there, Mike Wave, uh, Peter Murray, Graham Sane, and we have a discussion about the English underground magazines of the 60s and 70s, uh, Bernard Tsumi with his advertisements for architecture, Stefano Boeri, we discuss domus, and all of this becomes part of the exhibition because it's a continuous oral history that is incorporated. So in the end, the exhibition is like kind of an archive that travels, an archive on the go, and, and uh, that grows as it goes from city to city and incorporates new magazines and new stories. Uh, and, and, and so it's, in, in a way, an interactive ar archive, an archive that reacts to the people that, that meets and absorbs their reaction. For example, in Oslo, we discover, and even Archigram had forgotten about it, uh, how important uh, uh, Archigram was in Oslo, so much so that there was a particular publication called the Oslogram, published which somebody unearthed, and then I kind of, uh, that uh, prompted Martin, who found the Oslogram, to do his dissertation or his master thesis on this little magazine. So it was nice, the way in which we were kind of a traveling so of PhD students going to other places and somehow generating new kind of research in other places. This is Alison Sky from one of the few women uh, uh, editors of magazines, Stephen Hall, who did pamphlet architecture, Susan Stevens, who did Skyline, Hans Holine, who did Bao, Rem Kulhas, etc. Then we went to Canada, again, it's a different. Every time they give us the plans, we do a different project. Uh, every time a, a few of us go there and mount the exhibition, every time we have to explain the exhibition. This is a PhD student explaining the exhibition to the public in Montreal, which is a little bit like throwing people into the water. He, he is in the first year uh, at Princeton, right? But now he has to explain the exhibition to the public in Montreal. Okay, you can make a fool of yourself. I said to, he was very worried. I said, well, you know, it's Montreal. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not New York. Nobody knows you here. And of course, he, did, he kind of relieved him. He did great. And then from now on, since he knew he could do it, then he can do it also in London or wherever, right? And, and this is in Documenta. Again, you can see the project is every time uh, different, every time a different team does the project. There is this newsletter that we always publish that contains fragments of the, of the, of the interviews. And of course, there's always a party. Parties are always very important too, part of architecture, right? And, and then there's always a discussion here, for example, in Kassel, we are discussing with uh, German uh, uh, magazine makers. Then from there, we went to the AA in London, and here are images of the AA, and also of the band we have there. Of course, it's London, so there were a lot of people uh, the, uh, in London. I mean, here is the whole kind of uh, archigram uh, uh, group, and I think I see there also C. Peter Cook, and Dennis Crompton, and Dennis Sharp, who uh, is now gone. Uh, and uh, Stanley von Moss and David Green and uh, you know you can even <laughs> even Charles Jane who uh, you cannot believe it but when he was a young student at, uh, at at Harvard he was a radical and published a little publication called Connections so who knows who knew right and Claude Paran who was the star of that day with Architecture Principe and Madeleine Brissendorp so Peter Murray again so. Uh, Every time these are recorded, and in the, next, uh, in the next iteration of the exhibition, that is when we went to Barcelona, the videos of what had happened in New York or in London are also presented in the gallery. This is Rafael Moneo, and again. 
So from there we went to very quickly to Vancouver and then to Barcelona. And again, every time we find new magazines, for example, I am from Barcelona, I didn't know about, not anybody remember about some of these magazines like Construcción de la Ciudad or La Mosca, which is a magazine that Oriol Boigas used to do before Arquitecturas Biz. So every time, and here are people reading the, the facsimiles, and as I say, you have every time the projections of what had happened in other events. And the amazing thing is that everybody tells us that people spend hours there. So they sit there with their headphones, listen to what had happened in a storefront. But so the oral history, and this is very important because as you say, I already saw three or four people that are already gone. Just in the space of the time that we've been doing this project since 2006, several of these people are no longer with us. So it's a very important and urgent oral history. This was the event that happened in, in Barcelona. Peter Cook, Hans Collin, Chip Lord, who was from Ad, he's from Art Farm, Moneo and Boigas from Arquitecturas Bigs, this is a Spanish guy, and <laughs> Prada Pool, a really crazy guy, an inflatable. He was huge in the 60s, and who knew? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I really have to finish, but I want to tell you a couple of other projects that, uh, so after Clip Stanford that keeps going, right? Clip Stanford went from Barcelona to Murcia, now it's in Maastricht and uh, is going to Latin America where a number of, uh, a team of, uh, of people have done research on, uh, on uh, Latin American publications and we are again discovering a lot of little magazines in Chile, in Argentina, uh, in Mexico, etc., and I think will be great addition to the to the collection. Do you want me to finish? No, we can carry on. <laughs> no, because I don't want a minute. To... Okay, five minutes more to tell you that uh, the next project for the PSD, but the Clip Stanford continues, right? And there are a lot of people still involved in the project as it goes from country to country. The next one. We'll run the, we'll run the round table tomorrow. So you have to take us. Take as long as you like. No, the round table will be now. No, no, because we have to go out of work. We have to go, but you say at 6, it's 5.30 still. It's not even 5.30, it's 5.25. Just, it's fine. Okay. Maybe we do it. Five minutes. <laughs> Lenin, this next project uh, that I am doing with the, or, or that I did with the PhD student, Lenin from Levittown. Lenin from Levittown was also a studio, a studio that followed Lenin from Las Vegas in Adiel. Uh, done by, also by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, and they also were going to publish a book, uh, like Learning from Las Vegas, but they never got around to, to, the, to do the book. It's a very funny story, because while Learning from Las Vegas was already controversial, Learning from Levitan apparently went too far, right? So there was a lot of uh, animosity in the faculty at Yale, and that explains in many ways why the whole <laughs> thing uh, was not uh, 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 finalized. And they were very generous. We went to their office many times, and we talked to them. They are in their office, and here are my students. And we went to the archives. Here we are looking into the archives of Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, trying to reconstruct this whole book. And, and these are some of the things they have, all these advertisements and all these charts, looking at Levittown, really beautiful. Uh, and always that water damage, nobody had cared about them. They were in the basement, there was water damage. I mean, I thought they were really beautiful and that something could be done with them. It was a very serious study about uh, learning from Levitan about housing in America and uh, many questions about uh, uh, poverty and uh, racial stru struggles, etc. Uh, uh, many very important is the question of the media. They look at advertisement, but they also look at the representation of the house and domestic uh, life in, in electronics and television. Well, you can see in soap operas, eh? even in cartoons, like uh, generally different, uh, where Daisy Duck is living in one of these kind of Levittown kind of suburbs, but she dares to be, to be different. So the whole cartoon is about that. So we study all these, uh, these things they, uh, that they have collected, uh, all this information. And uh, we were on our way to do, like, like I say, a new edi uh, an edition of a never published book, Learning from Levittown, right? When uh, we were supposed to go in another visit, and Denise Scott Brown called me to say that she had broken her back. And I said, oh my God. She went up to, because, you know, they are not young. Uh, she gone up a ladder and she fell. And I said, oh my God. I said, why don't you, and, and then two days later, she called me, I'm so bored. Why don't you come and... And, and talk to me now, because I will never have more time than now. I'm really bored. And, and I say, oh, great, I'll, I'll go. I'll take them tomorrow. And, and then I hand the phone, and I thought to myself, 
what if I bring the students? So I call her, well, then it's, it will be okay if I bring the students and she say, oh yeah, bring them, I love the students. You know that I love the students. I love talking to, to people, bring them. Okay, I'll bring them. And then I thought, I hand the phone again and I thought to myself, this cannot go, you know. Uh, he had been very sick the year before and now she had broken her, her back. I thought to myself, this could be the last time. And I say, what if I bring a camera? So I, so I call again and I say, can I bring a filmmaker? And, and she says, oh, of course, my, my son is a filmmaker. I love filmmakers. It's a pity that he's not, <laughs> he's not in town and so on. So, so I, I grab a, a very young person. This is her, their house, which is the only kind of Art Nouveau house in America. And it's full of unbelievable things. It's full of unbelievable signs from the <laughs> incredible uh, uh, stuff. So now we are in the house. You see that she's wearing this. Uh, this brace that she say would have made Bucky Fuller proud of her, and, and there they are, the two sitting in the in the couch, and and this is the team, which is basically a student from uh, NYU and a sound guy, because I learned in the meantime that if you don't have the sound right, you never recover, right? <laughs> so now none of none of us, including myself, I have ever done a film. And we find ourselves in this incredible situation, and it turned out to be really beautiful, no? So we film them on the couch, talking about learning from Levitan, but also you won't believe what is in that house. You know, it's like Victorian clutter. They have fantastic, you know, Andy Warhols and, 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 and Jasper Jones and whatever, and they have it on top of uh, signs from... Uh, uh, and and the, uh, signs from Las Vegas and crazy stuff from... I mean, it's all kind of... Unbelievable. And you see, she's totally on there. She's talking with the students. She loves talking to the students. Sorry. OK. Um, <laughs> very quickly, next project is, uh, is a little bit of provocation. Uh, it's architecture, Playboy architecture. We should do that in Princeton. It's a little bit tricky. But I uh, uh, discovered working on the 60s and 70s, like you, know, you were talking about, you, know, you were doing research about, uh, I don't know, Ant Farm. And you end up uh, looking at Playboy, and you are looking at, uh, in, you know, and you realize that every architect from the 50s and 70, 60s and even 70s was in Playboy magazine. So there was a lot of architecture in Playboy, right? And so that, I thought to myself, this is a very interesting study. Let's, and so I went to the, the library, asked me, what do you want this year for bibliography? And I said, well, you have to get all the issues of Playboy from <laughs> 1953. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> they were so nervous about uh, people using them in what she said was inappropriate uh, ways that we have to keep them in the, in the PSD room. Where they couldn't be in the library. They were afraid of the under, you know, I said, but this is so lame. I mean, look at this. <laughs> they can get it all in the internet anyway. So it was great. All the, P all the Playboys came to, to the PSD room, and this is a timeline of all the different things. But basically, and very quickly, every architect that you can imagine, from Frank your right to send the red line in the sky to Miss Van der Rohe. Everybody is starting with the old guard and passing, of course, by the uh, mid uh, 20th century architects and designers were represented in Playboy and also represented in, in, in ways that that were better than in the professional magazines because, of course, they had better budgets, better photographers, etc. right? They were also the Playboy penthouse apartments and the Playboy uh, townhouses, which we also analyzed and discovered the relationship between these and Rudolf, Paul Rudolf townhouse, which is very striking. So I wonder whether Paul Rudolf was reading Playboy or <laughs> Playboy was reading Paul Rudolf. But look at that section. Anyway, so part of our analysis was, to, so it's architecture in Playboy and Playboy architecture. Architecture in Playboy is the way in which all these architects that we know so well how are they represented for, actually, for a mass audience in the context of, of Playboy. The thesis is basically the Playboy, you know, there was always enormous resistance to modern architecture in design, and design in the United States. And somehow, during the 50s, something happened. And otherwise, there's an unbelievable acceptance of, uh, of design and modern architecture. And I think play, Playboy play a humongous role in this. So they made it popular to have design in chair, right? I mean, I, get, I, I made that point, uh, millions of people did this round bed, they copied this round bed of the Playboy bed, uh, the media wall, all these uh, uh, things. I mean, they will, they will reflect on anything. This is, this, this is doing the new domestic landscape exhibition at MoMA, right? Between seconds, I mean, between, you know, a week, 
Playboy already have an article in which ha they have sexualized, right? So you have the same chairs and the same things of the new domestic landscape, but presented, they say, differently, right? Oh, the, the house of the century of... Uh, of, uh, of <laughs> so we had a great time with this project, let me tell you. <laughs> if I don't get thrown out of Princeton after this, I think they will never throw me out, but it was really great. So we realized, of course, that the house of the century not only was published in, in Playboy, but was one of the best publications ever of this house, because, again, they have the, of the bubble... Uh, 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 house or, or, or Bucky Fuller or, you know, Soleri or uh, Charles Moore. Charles Moore, who was then the dean of Yale, presented his house in Playboy as the, uh, as the, as the uh, apartment of a bachelor. I mean, he's gay, for God's sake. I mean, they... <laughs> But he was in the closet, it's true. But, but the, it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting tone of things that the apartment of a gay, uh, which he probably he had to be quiet, be quiet at that time still in the United States, right, will be turned into this kind of uh, uh, heterosexual... Uh, uh, Lovner, Morse, Safdi, you name it, and they are all in, uh, in, uh, in Playboy. So this is becoming um, uh, an exhibition uh, that uh, I, I am, uh, is going to be in Maastricht in the fall of uh, uh, 2000, uh, not this fall, next fall, so that will be 2011, right? Right, so we are working with uh, NAB, uh, uh, in NAI in uh, Bureau Europe in, in Maastricht towards an exhibition of, uh, of this. And we are also doing a book, a book that will collect all the uh, articles on, on uh, all the documents on Playboy and architecture, and also, of course, will be a critique of that. So there will be also essays by the students or whoever about this. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.